So the row over Angela Rayner's tax affairs concerns whether uh, she should have paid capital gains tax on the disposal of a property which she bought prior to her marriage. For anyone who buys a house, only owns one house, lives in that house as their home for the entire period they own it, they will not pay capital gains tax on the sale of the, of the property. However much it goes up, you won't pay any capital gains tax. Now, um, there are various ways then in which capital gains tax can arise. And the main one is if for some or all of the time that you own the house, you don't live in it. The main area that's difficult um, in relation to Angela Rayner's tax is understanding what happened when she got married. So um, let's imagine that two people each own their own property. They've been living independently. They meet um they uh spend a bit of time going between each other's properties but they still keep their own place so they've got a bolt hole and then subsequently they marry at the point they marry um a married couple is only allowed to have one uh primary residence so what they'd have to do assuming they're still sort of spending a bit of time at one and spending a bit of time at the other which is a little bit unusual, but let's go with that. Um, then they would be able to choose which of those properties they want to treat as their primary residence for capital gains tax purposes. And what they would do if they were with a tax advisor. So if somebody came to me in that situation and said, look, we are living together sort of. Uh, but some of the time I stay at my old house because I like a bit of peace and quiet. So um, what should we do? And a tax advisor will probably look at how long you've owned it, how much it's gone up in value and give you a little bit of advice as to which one is the best one to pick. Once you've picked one, you can change your mind about it as many times as you like. You can say, oh, no, no, I want it to be this one uh, as many times as you like. But if you don't pick one, then um, when one of those is sold, HMRC would look at the facts and they would say, which one did you stay in most? Um, and they would probably ask for quite a lot of evidence to find out, right, where were you registered with a doctor? Uh, where were you on the electoral roll? And try and decide. But it's still the case. And this is the, this is the bit that we'll never know unless Miss Rayner actually comes out and says so. We'll never know which property she and her husband nominated as their main residence. Um, it would be fine if she was living there some of the time and he wasn't because between the couple, they've got occupation of both. What you couldn't do is let the property to a tenant, go and live with your other half and then say, oh, but I think I want that one to be our main residence because... That one's going to go up a lot. So you'd actually have to spend some time there. And, you know, part of what's been in the press is a bit of debate about was she there? Wasn't she there? What did she call her home? Well, it doesn't really matter what she called her home, provided actually she was spending some time there. Then, to be fair, we've got to assume they may well have nominated that place as her main residence. I think in summary, yes, it is really complicated, but there are some bits about Miss Rayner's tax position that you can sort of be fairly confident on. And then ultimately summarise by saying we don't know which property they nominated. We'll never know. We'll never know whether she paid the right tax or she didn't pay the right tax. Um, and, you know, I think if she has made a mistake, it's entirely understandable because... <laughs> She's certainly not alone. <laughs> Let's talk about the law in relation to this. You know, neighbours have said they saw her go in and out every day. And is there a social media post? Provided she spent some time at her previous house, then both of those are a residence for the couple and the couple can still elect. She doesn't need to live there full time. And actually her claim that, it was her home is a little bit beside the point because both of them, both of them were homes. If it's, you know, I mean, I've seen some outlandish stories. Oh no, it was rented to her brother. Um, well, I'm going to dismiss that because nobody else has come forward. Um, and actually, if I rented my house to my brother, I'm, I still might go and kip over a few times when I'd fallen out with the other half or rather than kicking the cat, I'll go and go and stay somewhere else for a bit. So it's it's and it's absolutely plausible that she lived. She could have lived five, six days a week 
at her husband's former property and one day a week or less at her property provided and what, what they say is it's the quality of occupation in other words when she was there was she bunking up on the sofa because she'd let the house to somebody else but they didn't mind her coming to stay or did she have a bedroom and what I always say to people is go in the bathroom have a look see if there's a toothbrush there because if there's a toothbrush on the side in the bathroom, that's a fair indication that they expect to be coming back pretty regularly. Otherwise, they bring it with them. So it, it, I know HMRC can't see that. But because this is such a difficult area, because people will say to me, clients or accountants will say to me, so, Rebecca, how long do how long do you need to live there for for it to be your home? And I say it's not the amount of time; it's the quality of the occupation. Is it? Are you treating it as a home? Provided when she went there, she had her stuff, and she had her clothes in the wardrobe. It really doesn't matter, and it really doesn't matter if she posted on social media and said, "I'm home." Okay, irrelevant. She's got two homes. Politics, yeah, there's Ellie. Heck of a lot of politics kicking around with this. But, you know, I can sort of understand this because it's an area where the ordinary voter looks at it and goes, hang on a minute. You know, that doesn't seem right to me. We had a buy to let. We had to pay loads of tax on it. But it is that it, there's layer after layer of this legislation that people need to sort of understand. Um, and, and it is tricky. And, uh, you know, even accountants struggle with it sometimes. They They have to sit down in a darkened room and go, right, let me think about this. She owned that property, her husband owned that property, but at the time she sold it, she was married. And therefore, that might be her home, but if he thought that was his home, that doesn't work. So between the two of them, they would have had to choose which was their home. So she's, she's absolutely right in what she says, but it, I smile because it doesn't answer the question. It absolutely doesn't answer the question. And unless she's prepared to go, okay, so here's the deal. We nominated that as our main residence. And she's not going to do that because as far as she's concerned, it's private information. It's about her private tax affairs. I quite understand this. And obviously it's unfortunate that this has all started from a book that somebody wrote where they said, blah, blah, blah. And then everybody's jumped on the bandwagon. Otherwise, nobody would care. But yeah, that first bit absolutely doesn't answer the question. Did she take advice then? We don't know. Did she take advice when she got married? Probably not. Lots of people don't. Did she take advice when the story broke? If she took advice when the story broke, if she'd come to me and said, look, this is causing me a lot of problems. What can I do? I would have said, right, when did you buy it? How much was it? What stamp duty did you pay? What was the legal fees? When did you sell it? What was the estate agents and the legals? Did you do any work on it? Have you got any evidence of that? Even if you haven't got receipts, can we compare the purchase details and the sale details? When did you live there? What date did you marry? Okay, right, I've worked this out. I've worked that out. Well, actually, dear client, I think you've slipped up and you probably should have paid some tax. So I will now recommend that we contact HMRC and we do a voluntary disclosure. Now, if she's saying she's had advice and said she didn't owe any tax, then it's probably sort of a combination of, as I said, all of these different bits. Would I go to a tax lawyer for advice about this, I think I'd go to a chartered accountant actually, because they do it every day. Tax lawyers tend to be dealing with multinational companies and all sorts of complicated bits. Um, and accountants are, are advising people about this every day and tend to be pretty switched on and know which questions to ask. So I've got a feeling we won't see her legal advice. We're never going to know and, and just leave her alone. Do you know what this has served though? It's a really, really good illustration of how flaming complicated our tax system is. <laughs>